hello everybody. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are, or indeed good afternoon. Welcome to the IADI webinar on gender and development in Myanmar with Professor Marla Tun and Dr. Elizabeth Olivius. I'm Rowena, I'm going to be hosting today's discussion. I want to tell you just a little bit about IADI uh, for those of you who are new to IADI. It stands for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes, and it's a Europe-wide network of researchers and students in all fields of development. And it promotes the exchange of information among members to strengthen networks and influence decision makers. Um, the webinar series that you're, jo you're joining today uh, engages with researchers and practitioners from all around the world who bring different ideas to development thinking. And I know that uh, we have Mala today in New Mexico, Elizabeth in Sweden, I am in Australia, and I know we have a lot of people joining us from Asia and Myanmar. So while it's a European association, it really does have a lot of global engagement. And hello from Indonesia there. Um, Idiadi has a free newsletter, which you can get on their website. So if you are new, do sign up to it because you will get a lot of information about activities and research around the world. So before going into the, the content, some technical points. Um, Professor Mala Tun will speak first for about 15 minutes, which is very brief. And we are very grateful to our speakers for agreeing to keep in this time. And then I'm going to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Olivius, who will also speak. And after that, we will then have the discussion. So please make a note of the questions and the things that you're thinking of. Now to our first speaker, Marla Tun, Professor of Political Science at the University of New Mexico. She's a published author of many books on gender and inclusion and justice. She has held the Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship in Japan. She was also a fellow at the Kellogg Institute and the Radcliffe Institute. And she served as a consultant to the World Bank UN Women, Inter-American Development Bank, and many more. So we're very pleased to have her experience today, talking about her research with Francesca Jensenius. Uh, Mala is going to present survey data, which exposed some conservative public attitudes around gender in Myanmar, and what she feels may be needed to take place if those attitudes are ever to change. So over to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really grateful to participate uh, in this general project. Um, thank you to Rowena for organizing the seminar. Thanks to Aylin, who I think I saw uh, online here um, for getting us all together for this amazing project on development challenges in Myanmar. And to my co-presenter, Elizabeth, whom I met in um, Uppsala last, uh, last February, seems like decades ago, given everything that's happened between now and then. Um, and welcome to all of you. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. We know from many studies around the world that women's empowerment propels economic growth. Uh, women's participation in the labor force, their ownership rights over property and land, an end or reduction of violence against women, whether it's sexual violence, violence in the home, growth in women's access to education and women's access to health care. All of these are processes that contribute to overall national development. The problem is that in many countries around the world, we still see the persistence of extremely discriminatory legislation. We see the endurance of social norms that is widely held standards of behavior that legitimize and endorse the poor treatment of women and girls. And we see cultural attitudes that value men over women. So the question for economic development is how do we modify this cluster of legislation, norms, and attitudes so that women and girls everywhere can enjoy more opportunities and equal treatment? Um, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to ask two um, research questions. Uh, the first question is, what do national surveys that have taken place in Myanmar in the 2010s, what do these national surveys tell us about Burmese attitudes towards women's roles and rights? And then the next question is, how are these attitudes related to other aspects of political culture, such as traditionalism and authoritarianism?
So what I'm saying is, is that political culture is not the only thing that uh, determines the status of women and their opportunities, but we could consider it to be a major factor or a major clue enabling us to get a sense of what uh, the bigger picture of opportunities and obstacles to greater rights for women is. Um, and all of this information and everything that I'm going to say is in Francesca in my published paper, uh, the citation for which you can see below. And I believe that this paper is open access until the end of the month. And I'm also happy to to provide access um, of a previous version to um, other people after the embargo ends. Now the classical view. So what's the classical view about cultural attitudes and development? Um, it is that economic change is going to lead to cultural change. As the economy grows and develops, we're gonna see less traditional values, more secular values, more support for individual rights and free expression. Now, with some exceptions, this relationship has generally held in the West and Latin America. Um, however, uh, there are two revisionist developments to this classical view of how cultural changes. One are the findings um, that we see from the Asian barometer studies. There are now um, four or perhaps even five ways of, waves of Asian barometer studies throughout at least 12 countries in East and Southeast Asia. And these studies have largely found that economic growth, in contrast to the classical view, is compatible with continued support for traditional and authoritarian values. So people tend to support uh, non-democratic or at least hybrid forms of government. And women's social status is often lower than their political status. That is, women may be president in power, may even be president or prime minister, and yet their social status remains low. Um, the revisionist view implies that what we've seen in Myanmar in the past 10 years, that is political change toward more competitive politics, opening of the country to international actors, media, and so forth, that this may not actually lead to more liberal, more egalitarian changes in attitudes on women's rights and roles. Um, and in fact, the experience of many countries around the world shows us that when cultural attitudes and cultural norms, or at least a segment of them remain conservative, we may actually see greater contestation about women's rights and roles. And we may even see backsliding. So in countries like Brazil, Chile, Poland, Niger, Instead of a more open political scene leading to greater liberal liberalization of laws on women and gender, we've seen some backsliding and we've seen greater clashes between nationalist visions stressing cultural identity and um, feminist visions stressing greater rights for women. So we looked in this paper at two national surveys in Myanmar the first one was conducted by the Asia Foundation in 2014, and there were 3,000 respondents in a nationwide representative sample. And the Asian Barometer Survey conducted in 2015, um, the Asian Barometer had been going on for a very long time, but this was the first time the Asian Barometer team had actually been able to visit uh, Myanmar and do their research. And there were 1,620 respondents. Um, in addition, we sent um, a field research team to the country in 2016. And then the paper is also based on personal observations that I've made during uh, various trips to the country. So let's look into exactly what um, the data show here. So this map gives you a sense of the share of people who respond to the survey who agree with the statement that men make better political leaders than women. And nationally, you can see the red the more red the map is, the greater the share of people um, in the country who agree with the statement. And that's the left one. The right panel shows you people who agree that a university education is more important for a boy uh, than a girl. And this is from the Asia Foundation study. Uh, nationally, we can see that 70% of people agree that um, uh, men make better political leaders than women. So this is actually quite surprising because I started off doing most of my research in Latin America in the 90s. And even in the 90s in Latin America, you would see 80 to 90 percent of people agreeing that, you know, women are just as competent in politics as men. So for me to look at um, the data, which such a strong share of people talking about men making better political leaders than women was actually uh, quite 
quite, quite surprising. Um, the Asia Foundation survey also asked whether men made better leaders um, in business and whether women should make their own choices when they vote. And what these four panels show you, first of all, they show you that um, uh, a large share of people tend to agree with these quite uh, conservative statements about women's roles. And they also show you, so on the um, y-axis, you see the percent of people percent of respondents who agree with these statements. And on the x-axis, you see the age of respondents. And what I want you to take away from these figures is that the responses are quite consistent over age group, all right? So often we see in national surveys around the world that older people are more conservative than younger people. But that doesn't seem to be the case in Myanmar. In fact, even people in their 20s are agreeing in large shares that men make better political leaders than women and that men are better business leaders than women. So it's unlikely that these attitudes will change simply through generational cohort change. Young people are also quite, quite conservative according to these two surveys. Um, so the Asia Barometer Survey, I'm gonna move now to the Asia Barometer Survey um, in the interests of keeping going because of the time. Um, the Asia Barometer Survey asked not four, but only two questions about um, women's roles. But the Asia Barometer Survey also asked a whole battery of questions to measure general political cultural attitudes, attitudes toward traditional, traditional versus more secular or uh, uh, egalitarian forms of authority. They asked about attitudes toward democratic governance and so forth. But um, basically, I'm just gonna show you the, uh, the, the, the plots here. Um, in the two questions directly about women's roles in the Asian Barometer Survey, a large share of people believe that women should not be in politics. So the question in the Asian barometer was framed uh, differently. It wasn't men make better political leaders. It was framed, do you agree that women should not be in politics? And about 40% of people agreed. And this was consistent across age groups. And then it asked a question about if you could have only one child, would you prefer to have a boy child or a girl child? And a majority of respondents um, actually said that they prefer uh, a boy child. And this was um, higher than other countries um, in Southeast Asia. So the next question that we wanted to explore was not just the extent of the prevalence of these attitudes in Myanmar, but whether attitudes toward women's roles, how they're related to, toward other types of attitudes. So the first cluster of attitudes we were interested in are what is called in the literature traditional values. And in the Asian context, they did a lot of work on this in the Asian barometer, but in the Asian context, as opposed to Latin America or Europe, um, traditional values were defined to be concepts like valuing the family, uh, deference to teachers, deference to parents, avoiding conflict, so suppressing your own opinion if it would mean creating a conflict within the group, um, an aversion to self-assertion. So one of the things that Engelhardt and Weltzel and all of these kind of classical political cultural theorists say is that economic development and economic change makes uh, people value self-assertion and free expression. So by contrast, so-called traditional values are an aversion to self-assertion. Now in Burma, Overall, out of a total score of 13, zero being incredibly non-traditional and 13 being highly traditional, the average score of the respondents was 11, which indicates the persistence of these so-called traditional values in the country. Now, what do we mean by authoritarian values? So people don't just ask, oh, do you support democracy? Because around the world, if you ask people, do you support democracy, 99% will say yes. But they don't necessarily think about what democracy involves or requires. For example, pluralism. Can people have a diverse point, diverse points of view? Can you oppose the communist party? Like, can you think that the communist party is doing a bad job in China? Horizontal accountability. Is there a balance of power, checks and balances between the executive, the judiciary, the legislature? Can social groups like feminist movements or movements representing uh, ethnic minorities, can they organize? So what the authoritarian values 
uh, cluster of questions tests for is not, oh, do you blandly think that democracy is a good thing, but do you support these actual liberal constitutional principles that most of us think um, uh, endorse um, stable democracy? And um, in that sense, a nine was a, the highest authoritarian level um, and a zero would be the most uh, democratic. And the average score in Myanmar was 5.4, which was the second highest authoritarian score in Vietnam, uh, 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 in Southeast Asia after Vietnam. Now in this, um, let me just move my screen here. And so then we, this, what this cluster of plots and how, how am I doing on time, Rowena? You're at the, about the five minute mark. Okay, great. Yep, yep. So in this, so we did um, some regression analysis to test the relationship between views toward um, women's roles and uh, views about traditionalism and authoritarianism, as well as religious practice. So how often do you practice your religion? And what these panels show you, let's just start with the one on the left. On the y-axis, we see the percent of respondents who agree that women should not participate in politics as much as men. And on the x-axis, we see their traditionalism score. And the size of the round bubble are the number of respondents uh, who have that particular cluster of agreeing that women shouldn't participate in politics and also having very traditional values. So the first thing you see is the size of the bubble on the right side for traditionalism is, is, is the biggest. So a lot of people have very high traditionalism scores. And a lot of people in the upper part of the, docu of the, uh, of the panel, a lot of people also agree that women shouldn't participate in politics as much as men. So as people become more traditional and as people agree about women's political roles, uh, the, numbers grow, the numbers grow larger. In the next panel with the authoritarianism score, we see that um, people are more spread out. First of all, the bubbles are more spread out across this two to, uh, the, the two to eight markers you can see on authoritarianism, right? Although it, uh, uh, the share of people agreeing that women shouldn't participate in politics does also get bigger as you move to um, higher levels of authoritarianism. The takeaway here is that we didn't find these relationships with religious practice. Um, People who say they practice their religion, um, meditating, going to a pagoda, feeding monks, giving money to uh, pagodas, people who are more religiously observant are not necessarily um, more likely to, and there's a slight error in this, more like, not more uh, likely to agree that women shouldn't participate in politics. Okay, wrapping up here. Um, this is the same uh, sort of analysis, but for the question about preferring a boy child. And here we see all in this uh, descriptive, descriptive figure, as well as in the um, regression results, that there is, again, a strong relationship between preferring a boy child, uh, having traditional values, preferring a boy child, having a so-called authoritarian values, um, but not with uh, practicing religion on a daily basis. All right, so what do I want you to take away from this analysis of these two surveys? And just to say that we also did qualitative research. I'm not talking about that as much here because Elizabeth is gonna be giving a much more finely grained um, analysis of what norms look like on the ground, at least in um, border areas. Uh, but I can answer questions about that in the, uh, in, in the Q&A. So here I'm just presenting the, the survey data. Um, what I want you to take away are three things. Um, traditional authoritarian values are prominent. That is the case in other countries in East and Southeast Asia surveyed in the Asian barometer. Conservative gender attitudes are common. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's apparent, not just in the survey, but in uh, national qualitative studies, interviews and focus groups that NGOs have done. And the third is that they're related. So more traditional and more so-called authoritarian people have more restrictive visions of women's roles. So therefore, I think that this cluster of attitudes helps understand the competing trends we've seen in politics in the past 10 years. We've seen feminist groups organized nationwide. They've realized some successes 
Uh, they've worked with the government to create a national strategic plan. There have been some legal changes to social security laws, for example, and there has been a draft of a gender violence law. I'm not, I don't know that the gender violence law has been enacted. There's been opposition to it, especially uh, with the controversial issue of whether soldiers should be um, able to be punished for rapes and sexual violence committed uh, in military campaigns. But at the same time that we've seen these feminist successes, which are notable, right? We've seen uh, successes on the part of nationalist groups. Nationalist groups got their laws to protect race and religion approved, um, and they continue to advance an illiberal agenda. And what we think is that the prospects for a liberal feminism, and by liberal feminism, I simply mean the protection of women's individual rights uh, to be free from violence, to have equal access to property, to have equal access to marry, that that project is going to be difficult as long as we see these conservative public attitudes remaining and as long as there is popular support for nationalism. And when people are uh, skeptical of pluralism and a diversity of views, horizontal accountability, that opens the way, opens the door for support of nationalism. Nationalism wanting to crush pluralism and a diversity of views. So um, final slide, um, broader conclusions of what we can, what we can learn from this uh, Myanmar case study, as it were, for general theories of women's rights and, and development. Um, the first is, and I've been arguing this for a really long time, that simply having free elections or a more open country, open, open to the world, to the media and so forth, um, this does not on its own increase support for women's rights. In fact, the opposite may occur. Free elections may actually create conditions for extremely, uh, groups with extremely restrictive agendas regarding women who gain votes and become prominent. Uh, the second major conclusion is that though attitudes in Burma are conservative, that we've found in this study and in other qualitative studies, we have to keep in mind that attitudes in a country can change very quickly. In the US, we've seen a huge change in public support toward gay marriage in 10 years, even in five years. Huge change from a majority opposing gay marriage to a strong majority supporting gay marriage. In our research in Mexico, Francesca and my uh, study of four waves of um, nationwide surveys involving more than 100,000 women in Mexico, we've seen dramatic change in support for uh, the idea that women have to obey their male partners, right? It went from many people saying women should obey to a small minority thinking that women need to obey or follow uh, what their male partners want. And then um, with Melanie Dominguez, who I think is on Lenny Dominguez, Francesca, and I did some work on Japan, and we looked at many waves of public opinion surveys in Japan, and we saw that support for the idea that women are happiest if they are mothers and stay at home, support for that idea in Japan also changed dramatically in the 2000s. So this conservative attitude business is not a permanent obstacle. Attitudes can change. The big question is, how do attitudes change? And in all of these three cases mentioned above, we see attitudes change because feminist social movements, feminist civic groups, often working in alliance with international human rights groups and international feminist networks, organize in society, often from the ground up, organizing people in neighborhoods, organizing media campaigns, meeting with thought leaders, meeting with legislators, and they have a campaign to change attitudes. But what does a feminist campaign to change attitudes depend on? It depends on liberal rights. It depends on people having freedom of speech. It depends on people having the right to organize that is protected and defended. Uh, the right of people to actually have diverse points of view, to say the ruling party is doing a bad job, uh, this leader is doing a bad job, to be able to say that without getting thrown in jail or cyber bullied or harassed. So feminist projects to change public attitudes and change political culture 
depend on liberal rights. And so my final point, and this is how we end the paper as well, is that advances in women's rights do depend on the defense of liberal rights. Not because a liberal constitution is going to make women's rights come about automatically, but because the defense of liberal rights enables feminist groups who are largely responsible for these cultural changes to actually organize and operate in society without fear of persecution, jail, detention, and abuse. Thank you very much. I'll end there. Great. Thank you very much, Marla, for whizzing us through that uh, presentation. The charts in that presentation are available in Marla's paper, which um, you should have received by email yesterday, but we will be doing a follow-up with the recording, um, with links to papers, and if the presenters agree, to PDFs of their presentation as well. Um, I have noted that we have some some questions we're going to save them for the end um, because I know there are a lot of civil society groups here who have heard your points Mala on the importance of civic freedom so I think that could be an, an interesting discussion but I'm going to move straight on to our next speaker, speaker Dr Elizabeth Olivius uh, she is going to look specifically at how activities like economic development initiatives and conflict shape gender issues in Myanmar Dr. Olivius is a lecturer in peace and conflict studies in Umeå University in Sweden, and her research explores how gendered relations of power are produced and reshaped in conflict, displacement and peace building. And she's currently leading a very interesting looking project funded by the Swedish Foundation for Social Sciences and Humanities, which is focusing on Myanmar and explores the local varieties of peace that emerge in the shadow of ongoing armed conflict. But today she's going to discuss her research with Jenny Hedstrom, and I understand that Jenny uh, is, is also here on this webinar, that is going to look at people's actual lives, the importance of their everyday experience as a source of knowledge to understand what happens when the fighting stops, and what are the ways in which economic development processes that are implemented in Myanmar's transitional landscape intersect with existing gendered relations of power. So uh, please unmute yourself, Elizabeth, and uh, we are ready when you are. All right. Thank you, Rowena, for an excellent presentation that allows me to skip um, more introductions, I think. Um, this presentation reports the findings um, that are also in the article uh, by Jenny and myself in the same special issue as Mala's article. Uh, and it is open access. In our case, it's open access forever, so no rush. Can read it whenever you like to. Uh, and I also want to mention our ex excellent research assistant, Sinmar Pio, who has been uh, assisting us with this research. Um, so this is going to be a, quite a different angle on gender in Myanmar, focusing on the particularity of women's experiences in one part of the country rather than these broad, broad overarching patterns uh, that Mala has, has told us about. So the rationale for the type of research that we've been doing is basically that we think that we need to know how these macro processes of post-war reforms, that are ongoing and economic restructuring, economic development initiatives um, actually have effects in people's lives. Because right now, and I think this is always the case, very different stories about development in Myanmar could be told. Um, a top-down assessment could render an image of very quite a good situation of economic growth and progress in the past years. And this is not false, but it's not the whole story. And it doesn't tell us much about how the lives of specific individuals or groups are affected, how the, or how development processes interact with existing forms of inequality, and uh, which we think is particularly important with the legacies of decades of war in the country and the state. Um, to be very clear, both Jenny and myself are scholars coming from peace and conflict studies rather than development studies. So for us, it's very odd to see um, research on a, a country like Myanmar that now looks at ongoing development processes as if there wasn't a war before because obviously this shapes um, development in ceasefire areas like chaos state, but obviously also in other areas of the country where there's still ongoing war, which we also should not forget. Um, and we think that looking at how people's lives, how this actually plays out in women's lives is important uh, as a source of knowledge to learn about how these processes actually play out. 
Uh, and there's a long tradition of feminist scholarship um, taking that, that view. Um, and it's important especially to look at marginalized stories like women's experiences because this will give us facets of the story of what's going on in these areas that we wouldn't know without looking at these experiences, without talking to these people. Um, this can provide insights into how power and privilege are entrenched, reshaped, modified um, in these broader transitional post-war transformations that are ongoing. And this is based on interviews with um, around 40 individuals in mostly in November 2018. The context of chaos state uh, is, as many of you know, I'm sure, chaos state is the smallest of the so-called ethnic minority states. It's predominantly rural, it's quite remote, many places are difficult to get to, roads are bad and so on, um, and it's generally very poor. A lot of people live in poverty. The complex, the complex conflict landscape of the state uh, is another thing that still shapes development processes. This has been um, a conflict area with quite a large number of armed groups. Um, and many of these have agreed ceasefires with the government from the 90s and onwards. And the largest group, KNPP, uh, agreed the ceasefire in 2012. So as a result of that, there hasn't been much outright fighting since about the early 2000s. So basically there's been some kind of negative peace uh, situation since that for about 15 years, which has allowed for uh, an upsurge in um, post-war development efforts, foreign investment, uh, state-led efforts to regain territorial control, to develop the state, to extend social services, to improve infrastructure and so on. And this has especially increased after 2011 and the onset of um, a form of political transition in the country. And on top of this, uh, the state is still deeply shaped by legacies of war. Uh, people live in, still, many people still live in fear of that, that violence might return, even though uh, there hasn't actually been outright war for quite some time. This isn't felt to be certain by people. Uh, poverty remains. Um, lack of state provisioning is still a fact. So even though there's been a lot of development efforts of some sorts, like big infra infrastructure projects, energy projects, uh, efforts at industrialization and so on. Uh, this isn't actually benefiting people's lives that much. It's not giving people what they need in terms of social provisioning, like education, health services, uh, roads between villages and markets and so on. And this sustains gender disparities where women carry a very heavy burden, keeping families afloat, um, sustaining livelihoods, sustaining life. So this is the context for development intervention. This is where development takes place um, in chaos state. So what we wanted to look at then is how do development efforts play out in women's lives in these circumstances? How is that actually experienced? Our findings that we outline in the article are uh, structured around three main themes. The first one um, is that due to the legacy of armed conflict and a lot of ceasefire deals that have been reliant on economic incentives. So armed groups have been bought out of violence through economic incentives where they can have rights to, to engage in logging or different extractive industries and so on. And this has created a lot of black markets, a lot of informal war economies or post-war ceasefire economies. Kevin Woods has called this ceasefire capitalism, which is quite um, striking. So this has been the situation before the efforts, more recent efforts at state-led development then. Um, and this has placed women in positions where they first, as I said already, carry a very heavy domestic burden for caretaking, for keeping people alive. And secondly, where women are primarily employed in these informal wartime economies. And this keeps them from taking advantage of more formal post-war development opportunities that arise. Indeed, it also keeps them from things like taking political office or engaging more fully in civil society to relate to Mala's presentation. 
Um, this is something that a lot of rural women do. They do engage in local CSOs, but it's still quite difficult to do that given the circumstances where they um, don't have much time for it. Moreover, women's informal labor, for example, in the mining industry, which I will come back to an example from, from that, uh, also underpin economic reforms and women's reproductive labor, taking care of children, the elderly and so on in the absence of state provisioning that, that would, or the state investment in that. It also allows the state to then put resources into other things. So women's informal labor, women's reproductive labor actually underpin broader economic transformations that are ongoing. Uh, but at the same time, this, this comes as a very high price for women themselves. Um, access to and ownership of land was also mentioned by Mala as one key thing that's been seen in other contexts that's important for women's empowerment. And that is clearly gendered. Even though this, uh, it's debate, this may not be uh, the formal law, in practice, women tell us that women aren't recognized as heads of household and land titles aren't written in women's names and so on. So women's access to and ownership of land uh, is much more precarious uh, than for men. So this leaves them very vulnerable to land grabbing, um, not least in the context of uh, land needs for development projects. And this clearly contributes to insecurity for women and their livelihoods and in also then the livelihoods of their children and other dependents. So I'll talk a bit about all these three in turn and show you some examples from, from our data. Uh, so first of all, gender divisions of labor who have been um, entrenched during war and carried over into the post-war period. Um, shapes who benefits and who loses out in post-war transformation, who can benefit from development efforts going on now. Uh, so I already said that wartime social reproduction has been heavily reliant on women's labor. Uh, as men have joined armed groups, fled or died, women have also been often been the sole uh, people responsible for keeping some kind of everyday normal life going on, keeping children alive and so on. And this has to a large extent continued after the end of armed violence, which was largely about 15 years ago, uh, because there, is, there hasn't been much investment in state uh, welfare provisioning. So women still bear the full responsibility with very limited resources to keep families and communities afloat. And this, of course, renders women less mobile and prevent them from taking advantage of new opportunities. For example, jobs in a town uh, where they may need to travel from their village um, or a full time job period. And more than that, it also many of the women we spoke to report quite strong feelings of fear, trauma, exhaustion, stress as a result of both these traumas from war and these experiences of, of facing these pressures during war, but also the pressures of trying to keep families alive with limited or no access to land and no other opportunities and a lot of dependence in the current situation. Uh, this is an example uh, from one woman, woman we spoke to from um, the period of active fighting where she tells us about how during the war, all the men fled to hide in the jungle when the Burmese army came. So women faced the threats, women had to feed them, had to keep them happy to make, have them move on instead of something worse happening. Uh, they also had to um, keep good relations with rebel soldiers, for example, help, help them to hide guns and so on. All of this to stay alive, keep their families alive. Uh, and this is a quote from an elderly woman talking about what she needs to feel at peace. And uh, this was in the context of discussion about what peace means. And she says that uh, peace is about inner peace and I have no medicine to cure my feelings. I want medicines for my feelings. But even when I drink medicine, we're not exactly clear what kind of medicine, this cannot cure my fear, that disease, that hurt that comes from my past. I cannot cure that, I need medicine for that. So this is just one example of how women try to articulate the trauma and the stress that still affects their, their mind and their body in the current um, period. 
and also their opportunities of them taking advantage of different new opportunities. And this picture is of a few women uh, walking to or from a well to collect water. And this well was located, first of all, a few hours walk away from their village and in a cave. So they have to cl climb down a narrow passage into a cave that was dark and lacked oxygen to fill um, their water bottles and climb, climb back up. And as you can see, they're also carrying small children and this it's easy to imagine that this is very demanding physical work. Um, and women we interviewed told us that miscarriages have been reported when women have been doing these water uh, collection trips to this cave, which was part of their daily work. So this really shows how the effects of women's uh, heavy domestic responsibilities isn't just that they can't take up a better paid job, it's also about emotional and physical depletion and harm that continues into a period which is supposedly post-war and supposedly uh, upwards economic development. Uh, secondly, because of their heavy domestic responsibilities and the lack of time that that leaves women with, and because of these wartime and ceasefire illegal economies, for example, extractive industries and opium production, uh, women predominantly work in informal labor. So they're part of these war economies um, because that's where they can earn uh, a livelihood while also taking care of domestic responsibilities. And this is, is often quite precarious and uncertain and illegal labor like opium production. And which also means that state-led efforts to formalize the economy, um, bring the economy under state control instead of being informal war economies, which is supposedly, or in general development uh, ideology thought of as a good thing, and in the long term it probably is. It still means that women are disproportionately affected by efforts to root out opium production or to bring extractive industries under state control. Uh, because this strips away their livelihoods in the informal sector. And this is a quote from uh, a poppy farmer, a woman poppy farmer. Sometimes the police will force you to destroy your own poppy fields. If the police destroys your farm, you cannot say anything. You can just sit and watch. You can cry, but crying won't work. And this is a quote from uh, a woman working in um, informal lead mining. Um, so inside the mines only can work. And this was explained to us as being because of the domestic caring responsibilities that women have. Women have to look after the children so they cannot go far away or work long days. They cannot work inside the mine. Therefore, they cannot take up formal jobs with the mining company. Instead, they collect um, stones uh, in the slag heap and try to clean small pieces of lead. Um, and sell them back to the comp company or at, on the black market so that they can earn um, some money. So this shows that the link also between women's uh, reproductive work, women's heavy caring responsibilities and the division of labor between formal and informal work. And this is an image of a woman cleaning um, small stones found in the, the slag heap outside of these mines. Finally, the final point is about land rights. In Kyaw State, as in many uh, rural areas and many border areas, land has generally been used customarily rather than being individually owned with formal land titles. And this means that when land is needed for military expansion, which still also happens, but also development efforts like the building of a dam, then the government has created laws that makes it quite easy and legitimizes appropriation of uh, customary land because supposedly no, one's own, no one owns it. And to counter this, there's been efforts to actually off issue formal land titles to land users. But women are rarely recognized in these processes. So women have much lower degree of formal land ownership. And as a result, when, when a dam is going to be built, women have very low chances of getting compensation when their land is taken, which leads to uh, gendered insecurity and poverty. And this is especially serious in a context of male migration during war to flee from violence or to fight, 
and also post-war male migration to take up jobs or even find any job somewhere else. So there's a lot of women-led households and those are especially vulnerable to have their land taken and not have any chances of compensation. Uh, this is a quote from a woman who experienced that. Um, she was forcibly relocated in 2013 because of a dam project. So this is an example of the government's development strategy would focus on um, infrastructure and energy. And due to persistent CSO activism, some people that in this relocation process managed to get compensation. But this woman did not because her land was not on any formal land title. And she said that the local authorities didn't even recognize the woman's name, just only the leader of the family. And the leader is to them a man, so nothing for women. They have no more land for cultivation. 90% of people are farmers and now they have no land to survive. So to conclude, Obviously, maybe for anyone with any experience in feminist analysis, development is of course shaped by and in turn shapes existing gender relations of power in society. And we think that a particular important dimension of this in this context is how the gender legacies of war shape how post-war development efforts play out on the ground and who can benefit from them. And this is really important to understand because if not, post-war reforms may unintentionally entrench these disparities. Um, for example, if it's not without a good understanding of how women rely on the informal economy, it's maybe not easy to understand how opium eradication projects popular with international donors um, can actually harm women and entrench gendered economic disparities. So I'm not saying that the war economies shouldn't be formalized or their opium production shouldn't be um, eradicated. But when that is done, it has to be done with an awareness of the gendered disparities um, that may result, the gender dynamics that already shape people's lives in this context, so that they, these effects can be counteracted. Methodologically, we think that our findings in this analysis uh, along with many other similar feminist accounts, um, demonstrates the importance of taking everyday experiences seriously as critical sources of knowledge, even if these people we talk to are not a representative sample of a larger population, even though this is one group of women in one area of the country, their experiences tell us an important part of the story of how development in Myanmar actually plays out today and how that could and that is necessary to know, to think about how that could be improved to serve people's lives better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, uh, and, and to the research team working on that research. I think you really brought um, women from Myanmar into the room with us, as well as your perspectives on peace studies. So we're really grateful for that. I'm going to go straight into the questions because they are coming in thick and fast. And I'm, I'm actually going to open with Mala so they give you a chance to recover, Elizabeth. Um, Mala, I'm going to open with the, the question around donors because so many of us work with donors. Um, so the question from Edgar was if the gender equality agenda is donor driven, what should donors do to fight the backsliding that you have identified in Myanmar? So, <clears throat> The first thing is, I think that the fact that it's donor driven or that people perceive it's donor driven, that um, women's rights are something that the West is pushing on a country like Myanmar, that is exactly um, part of the problem. That it can't be seen, women's rights can't be seen as Western global, you know, outside interventionists. It needs to, <clears throat> it needs to be constructed and perceived um, as something from the bottom up. And so I actually, um, I think that uh, a group like Musawa, and Musawa started as a group that was creating a Muslim vision and justification for women's rights. So reimagining classical Muslim texts as supporting human rights and equal rights for women is a good example. I mean, I think that we need to, to work with indigenous sources and reimagine Buddhism as a cause for women, as a, as a, as a conceptual ground for women's liberal rights. But I just think that to, that to the extent to which the donors can encourage uh, 
autonomous local construction, even if it seems to be pitched in a, in a, in a religious way, which might seem illiberal, that, that, that's promising. I think that right now it's tough as long as China stays on the other side and as long as China promotes development without, um, you know, with, as long as China promotes a development that's intolerant of minorities and, and, and doesn't regard women's equal participation, that's gonna be a global uh, permanent obstacle. Um, I just wanna actually take, there was another question in there about illiberal nationalism and religion. Uh, just to clarify, I think that there is a long history in, in Burma, and we talk about this in the paper, of using Buddhism to support a nationalist agenda. That is a political use of Buddhism. Even an appropriation of Buddhism to justify intolerance and violence against minorities. And that's a different discourse and project from everyday religious practice. So I think we need to sort of separate and look at religion as a site of struggle, as a field that can be appropriated, can be instrumentalized, can be weaponized for various projects. And then an everyday practice of religion, which, which, which may, be, may be something different. So I think that we found that religious practice is not associated with conservative and traditional views, but that doesn't mean that historically over more than a hundred years that political actors with exclusionary agendas and nationalist agendas have seized on this terrain of Buddhism to find discursive justification for their positions. Great, thank you for that Marla. And we have uh, a kind of couple of technical questions around the 2008 constitution and, and whether it guarantees rights and if there's any special reservations uh, for the legislative assembly. Um, did you want to comment on that? So there is a special, um, there is a paper in the special issue on the question of gender quotas and women's representation. And a lot of the issue has surrounded whether or not different ethnic parties should have guarantees of representation. I do not believe that there is a national quota law in Myanmar right now, but I will also say, since I've also worked on this issue for a while, that it doesn't matter. I think that the national quota law is a distraction and that women's quotas are a distraction and that this does not lead to development at all. Having women in politics is perfectly compatible with extreme gender inequality and conservative attitudes towards women's rights. And it's actually an easy thing for countries to do to make it seem like they're making gestures toward equality without actually changing anything structural or substantive um, on the ground. Great, thank you. And that addresses that, that discussion that people are having about, about women leaders. Um, a question for you to Elizabeth, if you could expand on your sample and just give a little bit more information about the, the demographics of your sample. Sure. This is all available in the papers for someone who really wants all the details and want to know what parts of chaos state women we talked to came from and all of that details. I will encourage you to read the papers. I'll keep this brief. Uh, but basically, we talked to a few categories of people. One is just rural women in villages or from villages um, across the states. Second, people from CSOs. And this was women from women's organizations. And many of those are still rural women. They're not any kind of elite women um, in most cases, but people who have chosen to engage in, in a CSO. And there were also some CSOs working on peace issues, environmental issues, and refugee return issues. We then also talked to some representatives from armed groups in the state. And that was the main categories of, of respondents. I'm gonna tell Jenny to add, if you want to add here. If Feel not. free to join Jenny, who has also just put in the chat and clarified there is no quota for women in politics in Myanmar. If Jenny doesn't jump in, um, read the paper if you want more, more yeah, details. Yeah, will we will be resending uh, the links out. Um, a question has just come in. Is it a question or a comment? I love how when we're still on webinars, I'm still deciphering if it's a question or a comment. Uh, Michelle, if you are there and you can unmute, and if it is a question, feel free to jump in while we read it. Hello. And, <laughs> hi. 
<laughs> there I am. So uh, my question is, uh, just recently Germany stopped the uh, development cooperation with Myanmar. And from our opinion, it might be that China fills this gap. And um, yeah, raises the development cooperation uh, with Myanmar. And now, um, yeah, I would be interested what in your opinion could be effects uh, with regard to the human rights and women's rights. And um, yeah, thank you for clearing that question. Uh, let me just make sure I'm not muted. So I actually think the effects could not be good and not just with human rights or women's rights, but also with sustainability, the environment, pollution, emissions, deforestation, all, all, of, all of this agenda that's very dear to those of us in the West and Western donors is in jeopardy to the extent that China begins to uh, fill its space. And China already has a massive role um, in Myanmar. But so I, I totally understand that um, donors want to pull out because of the illiberal uh, persecution of minorities and genocide in Myanmar. But um, there, there may be consequences. I think it's a very, very tricky, tricky scenario right now. Thank you. Uh, Mala, I have a question for you because you have made it very clear and because I come from an NGO background. So you're, uh, you're talking about the importance of, of movements being grassroots and organic and led, led by the people, um, but they also need these civic freedoms in which to operate. In your experience, will a women's rights group organically go, well, we would like to campaign for issue X, but to do that, we need to Revol resolve something in the political landscape or, you know, in the way civil society operates. So we're going to, to do, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So how does that happen? So I, I was, um, I think it doesn't take just women's civic organization from the bottom up to change major laws. So in Laurel Weldon and my book on the logics of gender justice, we say that, uh, there are different types of gender equality issues and each involves or follows a different logic or trajectory of change. So you can have issues where women's movements and feminist movements own the issue and their agency is singularly responsible for getting the issue on the agenda and change like gender violence and sexual violence. But then there are issues that involve church, state and religious doctrine, like in the Roman Catholic context, divorce and abortion, um, or in the Muslim family law context, guardianship, right? And those issues, it takes a giant alliance of actors, not just feminist movements, but a giant alliance, as well as political changes that weaken the hold of religious leaders on the state and political legitimacy. So I think that depending on the issue, there is a totally different trajectory um, leading, leading to change. Now, in terms of the chicken and the egg, I think that anything can happen. And I would um, encourage people to look at Yuan Yuan Ong's book about how China escaped the poverty trap. And she shows that it's not just, you know, the market or the state, but it's a co-evolutionary process. And I think with civil society and the state, it's also a co-evolutionary process in terms of who leads change and who takes, who has agency and who, yeah, who's, who's in charge. So I think that thinking of things not as, you know, this causes that, but as a co-evolutionary process with different actors and factors having different roles at different points in time is a, is a, is a more appropriate conceptual model. And um, yeah, this has been great. Um, and I, um, people can email me if they have more questions uh, later on, because I think that we're, we're running out of time. But I'm also happy to be here with Elizabeth, who's giving it a, a complimentary perspective from a different part of the country and I think ultimately more informative types of data than looking at survey responses. Well, thank you both very much for your time. We've managed to keep on time so far um, and our participants are being really well behaved in case anyone is lurking with any questions at this stage or indeed a comment. And I particularly encourage those of you who are working in Myanmar or indeed joining us this evening from Myanmar, um, if you have anything final you want to add or if you want to uh, message me, then please do. I can always pass on the question to our researchers.
Otherwise, um, a reminder, I will be emailing uh, the recording. It takes a few days. We, we tidy it up. Um, we'll send it out. Uh, we'll include the links to the papers and any of the, the good links that you've put into this chat. Um, if you guys are happy for the presentation PDFs to be shared, we can also send those as well. And, and just a short plug that we are doing this again. We're not this very same um, topic, but we are doing a webinar on land conflict in Myanmar uh, on the 22nd of June. And so I will put uh, details of that. It's, it's not as, as late if you are in Asia um, and it'll be in, in the roundup email that I send to you. So thank you everyone for your time this evening, this morning, wherever you are. And thank you so much uh, to both of um, our speakers for contributing so much knowledge today.